Good morning, and this is Becoming a Google Certified Educator, uh, Level 2, Part 5. Um, today we're going to look at organizing your class and school materials more effectively. This particular unit focuses very heavily on Drive, on Sites, on Blogger, um, Classroom, and it mentions Docs. Um, this was probably the meatiest unit so far that I've gone through in the Google uh, Advanced Training. The first thing that they talk about is classroom personalization. Um, like many of the units, it starts out with four classroom testimonials, four different teachers saying how they used classroom and how they personalized classroom. The first, cla the first teacher speaks about how he has children register for multiple classes, one class in classroom for their main course and then another classroom for their section in that course and thus differentiates. So your remedial would be in one class, your advanced kids would be in another class and they could get different assignments that way. Um, I'm not sure, I think the kids would catch on to which class they were in and with differentiation we try generally not to let them know they're in the remedial class. It can be kind of a disheartening factor, but it works for this particular teacher. Um, another teacher was very enthusiastic because Classroom is a mobile app. You can have it on your, your cell phone, your tablet. Um, another teacher uh, uses Classroom as the do now, as the start point, as the way that she communicates her lessons to the class. Um, the last teacher talks about using the Classroom stream, the chat function. I have used the chat function with my students. It did not go well. There's a lot of yes, YOLO, lots of internet slang. It's, it didn't work that well for me, but for this teacher, he communicated expectations in a clear and magical way that the students listened to, and it sparked a lot of debate and collaboration. Good for you, teacher four. Things you should be able to do in classroom. Um, based on this lesson, you should be able to figure out how to set up your class. You can only put down two factors for each class, class name and section. You can't differentiate it by, by grade level or, or something like that in the actual confines of the program. That doesn't mean that you can't in practice really do that. Um, you can personalize the look of your classroom, including your banner. Um, you can add course materials to the About page. You can actually add a syllabus. You could add a video of yourself speaking to parents. Um, and you can change the control settings on the main page stream so that only you can put down things on the main stream and your children can't write things that you don't want them to write. Um, I wanted to briefly show my own classroom. And these are my classrooms. I have my uh, class period and my course by year. Eventually I'll be archiving these because the 2015-2016 year is over. I also have one just for substitute plans and I have one called the test kitchen where if I'm not sure of what I'm doing on classroom, I'll start it out with test kitchen and then share that post to my other classrooms. I found it's really helpful. This is not something on the official training, it's just a tip I've, I've come up with. Then they move on to Blogger. I've never used Blogger. Um, they talk about how students use blogs to collect ideas, reflect on lessons, voice their opinions, collect their work, and make the experience authentic. Um, because students like to perform for the, for the public and for their friends. Blogs can be used by teachers to post resources, share current events, get a message out, share ideas with the wider community of teachers, share photos, share updates with students' families, share student work, videos, slides, and to communicate with the public in general. Blogger is one more means of communication and connecting with, pam with parents, with families, with colleagues, with students. There are multiple options for blog authorship. Pretty much anybody that you want to author a blog can author a blog. Teachers can be the sole author. One blog can have a team of teachers. One class blog can have all students. Every student can have their own personal blog. It's very freeform. The two blogger tips they offer are that um, if you want to add photos, videos, or documents, you can store the photos in Google Photos. 
videos in YouTube and documents in Google Drive. And as far as the, bri the privacy on a blogger blog goes, your blog can be public and searchable by Google. Your blog can be unlisted so that people need the link to view it, or your blog can be private and you can invite specific people to view it. This is really crucial when you're talking about exposing student work to the public. So you want to think about what is your district's media policy and what can you work with. As far as creating a syllabus goal goes, the Google training seems to focus on making your syllabus attractive and interesting and engaging for your students, something I've never really thought about in terms of a syllabus. I've thought about it in terms of lessons, but as far as the syllabus, I kind of give the kids the syllabus and say, this is what I'm going to do. However, Google believes that you need to make it interesting and varied and fresh. They suggest creating the Google Docs to create your syllabus, adding a table of contents, depending on how large your syllabus is, Add a table through the table and an insert table if you have a table, maybe for your rubric, maybe for your scoring rationale. When you add collaborators, the default setting is to alert them there is a doc you shared via email. That's true of any doc. If you change it after the beginning and want to let people know, you can add, you can select file, email collaborators, or you can put a comments note and add plus to the email that you want to send it to, and it will automatically send that comment right to the person's email. You can add in equations, you can add in images through the insert buttons once again, and you can manipulate that image in ways that include transparency, brightness, recoloring um, through the image options. You can get to image options by right clicking on the image, or you can use the crop option to crop the image. I do want to mention that I think that you should take the test on a desktop with a mouse. It's much easier than using a trackpad or a laptop. The mouse will make the test go much faster. Then we get to digital portfolios. The two means of making a digital portfolio according to Google here is our drive and sites. Some of your students may not have access to sites depending on your domain administrator. As of last year, my seventh graders did not have the access to make a website. However, it is assumed that you will know Google Sites as part of this training. I suggest creating your own Google site before taking the test. And the best way to learn how to, take, how to do a Google site is to actually create it and kind of fumble through the creation of your first website. It's going to be the best way you learn the various options. It's not something that the instruction manual is going to help you learn. There was teacher testimonials on how they used sites for various um, student benefit. The first teacher used sites for students to display their well-rounded personalities and abilities. The second teacher used Drive because it can have, you can say basically anything in a drive. The third teacher Allowed, thought that sites allowed students to take ownership of their work, um, get feedback from friends, and communicate, again, the whole student. Uh, teacher 4 allowed students to save pictures and videos of their artwork in Drive and then create a site display, displaying their best work at the end of the year, so Drive became sites. Drive was a storage place and a resource for them to eventually create a website, which is actually pretty cool. Lastly, they gave a couple comments and suggestions for the use of Drive Insights. I didn't know that Google Apps for Education Drive accounts have no data limit. That's kind of useful to know. Also, you want to consider using a standard naming convention for your students' Drive folders before they share them out with you, like first name plus last name plus portfolio. I would suggest the class period or section of your student as well before you put portfolio in there, it's much easier for sorting. For sites, they talk about using three kinds of pages, a web page, announcements, and the list page. You want to consider the architecture of your site. You want to consider almost a workflow chart. They're going to come into the home page. Okay, where are they going to go from there? Where do you want them to go from there? This is kind of designing the user experience of your website, if you're familiar with the idea of UX design. And you want to think, what is the simplest way for my students to get where I want them to go? And that's what you should do before you start making a website. 
You can create your own sites template if you find you're making the same kind of page over and over again and that Google doesn't offer you that kind of page. You can customize your site by creating a class header, customizing the colors, the fonts, the theme. You can modify the layout, the navigation bar. Sites is very much a flexible medium for you to communicate through. You can share docs, calendars, Google Maps, YouTube videos, Google Forms through links or embedding them on the site. No matter what you share, if you are sharing them out from your drive, make sure your sharing permissions allow the public or the students or everybody at your district to access the materials that you are linking or embedding. This was a very dense unit. I suggest taking a look over it yourself before you start the test. And that's it, and it's on to the next part of the training.